one of my core values was share without fear. I realized that that's the phrase that I need to tell myself. One way to tweet that would be share in the face of fear. Oh, if I were to share in the face of fear, I would tell my mom I love her more often. <laughs> so what about texting or calling your mom now? Sure, in my phone. All right, just texted her, I love you. With a little kiss emoji. And you, you didn't combust into flames. No, <laughs> I managed it. <laughs> You're the master of a guest house. And each day it's about seeing who arrives at the house. Ah, right now there's fear here. And we can move to a place where we no longer try and reject the fear. Yeah. Or push it away. Because whatever we resist will persist. Fear will always exist. It's what do we do in the face of it. Nice. That's great. Shoot is a fabrication of the mind. The mind will say... The world should be this way. But the truth is... And is there any, anything else that's on, been on your mind or is there any, anything else that brings up frustrations or negative emotions? I'm just going to think out loud here. Uh, one thing that I've kind of been thinking about for a while is that I feel like I don't experience much of a range of human emotion mm. in that I'm generally quite tranquil. And I'm not sure if that, I mean, I suspect part of this is the stoicism Kool-Aid that I've been drinking for 10 plus years. Um, and so I, I, I feel like I tend to rarely experience negative emotions. Yeah. But if I were to psychoanalyze myself, I might suggest that, well, maybe that's because I have all these sort of defense mechanisms that are in, pl in place that are stopping me from being vulnerable and therefore stopping me from experiencing the full range of human emotion because I'm scared of something or other. Um, that's a bit that I've never quite figured out. Yeah. I've always been like, huh, I wonder if psychedelics would, would be a way of getting through that. But yeah. 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 We could explore that as well. Nice. Yeah. So do you want to start? How do you want to start with the, what came up in the... Yeah, I guess if this were a normal coaching session and like, let's say it was the first time that we were, we, we've had our intro intro call and now it's, it's like, right, first coaching session. Yeah. How would, how would you normally go about it? I suppose first coaching session I'd ask what would be critical for you to resolve right now. And is this like in personal life or business life or? It could be anything that comes to mind. A lot of the time whenever I speak to CEOs or people who are doing well in business, it's actually the personal realm which is impacting the most. It's beginning to creep into their headspace, their energy, their, their cognitive real estate. And so it's actually these struggles or dilemmas or an area where they feel stuck in their life. I don't know if I could be just bullshitting myself, but I feel like life is just generally good. And yeah. um, I'm just trying to think, what are, the, what are the areas in which I guess I would feel stuck? Yeah, I guess I, I, don't, I, I don't really relate to the, the, the idea of feeling stuck. Yeah. I don't think I feel stuck in any area of my life. Yeah. Um, well, why don't we go to what came up in the conversation? Sure. So whenever we were talking this part came up with your partner uh, are we mentioning her name yeah let's call her jane jane okay <laughs> jane <laughs> so whenever we whenever we had our conversation your relationship with jane came up in terms of what you do whenever you give a compliment yeah can yeah. you tell me about that yeah so um this was certainly a thing i think i, I think I've, I've i've gotten slightly better at this over time but when giving Jay, so A, for, for months, I just never really said anything nice to her. Um, mm -hmm. And it was only many months into our relationship that she was like, you know, I'm surprised that you don't compliment me very much. Yeah. And I was like, what? I, I, I kind of didn't, didn't even realize that I didn't, do, that I didn't do that. And then when I would notice her looking really nice or I just wanted to comment that, hey, you look really beautiful today. I would feel a sort of like a massive sense of cringe at like saying that. Yeah. And I had to be like, I, w I would, you know, I learned the, you know, just, just say it in a kind of, uh, kind of joking way. Yeah. Um, so even before we go there, yeah. <clears throat> if we split that up, initially you noticed that you wouldn't give compliments. Mm. What would have been the worst thing about giving a compliment? The thing that I was worried about is that, especially if I gave her a compliment on like how pretty she looked, yeah. that then that would badge me as sort of just one of those guys who would like hit on her at uni or randomly and so, like sort of that veering into like catcalling and stuff. 
Yeah. But also part of me was worried that like, I don't want her to think that the only reason I like her is because she's pretty and therefore I'm not going to comment on her looks at all. Right. Uh, kind right. of thing. Yeah. yeah. Because what would that have said about you? That would have said that I'm shallow, superficial twat, basically. Yeah. Um, because having having read a couple of books about this, you know, how to... In, you know, bu- books that are sort of like how to win friends and influence people, although, although I don't think that talks about this specifically, they say, you know, compliment... When, when you're giving a sincere compliment, you want to compliment something about the person and not about, mm. like, their looks or about, you know, something that they've chosen rather than something yeah. they've not chosen. And so I'd always immediately veer away from any kind of compliments about looks. Yeah. But I think that meant that I was just sort of veering away from compliments in general. Yeah. Because also I don't really give people compliments very often. And so it's, it just yeah. felt quite like, ugh, to yeah. even kind of approach that area. So the first thing you noticed is that there's something that you wanted to do and there was something that was there that you wanted to speak out, but then there was this fear of judgment blocking you from saying it. Yes. And then what was the impact of not acting from that place of truth? Not much of an impact in the short term, but over time it made Jane think that I didn't like her, basically, because yeah. she, in her model, and I think in a lot of people's people's models, if you like someone, then you would compliment them fairly regularly. Yeah. Um, the whole words of affirmation thing. Yeah. And because I wasn't doing that, she felt like I didn't really care about her. Yeah. Um, and was just sort of going through the motions of the relationship or whatever. And then what were the consequences of, of that, where she was thinking... Perhaps he's actually not that interested. Yeah, so there were a few occasions where her, where she felt like, um, she felt quite upset because, like, we'd be spending time together and then I'd have to go somewhere and I wouldn't, like, hug her goodbye or yeah. something or hug her hello or, like, say something nice to her. And mm-hmm. so she felt like, she just, she, she described it as a kind of her, her love tank being, em- being empty. Yeah. Um, and when her love tank was empty, then she would sort of feel more, I guess just like feel bad. Yeah. Um, and it was good that like we, you know, each, every every few weeks we do a sort of relationship review where we go through these like 10 questions on a notion template and stuff. Um, and this idea of this idea of compliments came up a couple of times. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it took like two or three times for me to really clock that, oh, this is a thing that like I'm, I'm allowed to say something, I'm, I'm allowed to say nice things to her. And in fact, this is this is a good thing to do. Totally, yeah. totally. So I think even instantly, if you take a take a step back, there's the idea of who we should be, and there's a, and your mind will have an idea of what it means to be a good boyfriend, and your mind will have an idea of who you don't want to be. Yeah, and it doesn't want to be that catcalling guy who's just picking girls up and who's just interested in their looks. And then there's the internal you who has a, a drive or a, a movement towards what you want to do, what you want yeah. to express. And I'd say that's acting from a place of truth. And we'll always have this battle in life between the mind's perception of who we should be, which will act from a place of fear in terms of the perception of others of us. Yep. And there's the deeper... A spring of joy and love and compassion that just wants to be expressed that wants to say jane i think you look beautiful or jane you look so hot right now or whatever it might be yeah and then you're describing there were times when you would feel it welling up and you'd notice you'd notice you want to say something but then the feeling would block you yeah yeah, yeah. so tell me about that feeling it was almost the feeling I had when you when you said just now, Jane, you look really hot right now. Where yeah. I, I was immediately like, oh, hello, <laughs> that's the, that's a bit much, <laughs> you know, yeah. that that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because um, I guess I I associate the word hot also with like sort of slightly seedy guys kind of thing, yeah. where something like beautiful or cute it feels like it doesn't have that like overly sexualization y element to yes. it. Um, yeah, just you know, Ali, yeah. you look really hot right now. Oh, thank you. That's very kind. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And so talk to me around that feeling. So part of it was just feeling kind of yucky about it being seedy or something that would be objectifying her. Yeah. Yeah. What else What else did it feel like? Did you notice it in your body? Kind of, yeah. Yeah. Where did you feel it? Hard to say. Um, I don't often know where I feel emotions about things. Yeah. Or did you feel any, at one point you kind of 
pointed here. Didn't yeah. feel anything. Yeah, this kind of general yeah. vicinity. Yeah. Yeah. So again, solar plex is kind of. Yeah. And was it like a was it like a tightness or was there any tension? Yeah, tension. Yeah. I guess. Yeah, some kind of tension in this sort of this sort of region of like oh uh oh <laughs> yeah 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 totally. And then what happened next? What would usually happen next when you would feel that? I think before we'd had that conversation, that would have stopped me from saying the thing. Right. After we'd had the conversation and a couple of times, I kind of realized that, oh, okay, the person that she, yeah, sort of, her, what, what she needs in the relationship is more words of affirmation. Yeah. I want to be the sort of person that offers words of affirmation, you know, sincerely and freely and that kind of thing. Yeah. Therefore, I'm going to get over my cringe response. Yeah. And go for it and just say the thing. And over time with her, I've become more comfortable about saying, kind of expressing feelings and emotions sincerely. Um, with my mum, for example, I still really struggle to say to my mum, I love you. Yeah. Because it's not a thing that I've said very much growing up. Yeah. And in my mind, that's like, <laughs> it doesn't feel like me to say this, I want to say this thing, but like I feel blocked by this this perception of what I think I used to be when I was a kid. Totally. Which is, I feel like the version that my mum thinks I still am. And it's like, the, then the mind kind of gets in the way. It's like, oh, it's just safer to just not say I love you. Totally. But I think it's a beautiful level of awareness to see that there's a part of you, would you say it's true that there's a part of you that wants to say I love you? Hmm. And then you notice a block. Yep. And this whole spiritual journey is about noticing that, being aware of that. that. Okay. So you notice what you'd love, or what you'd love to create or do, or what actions you'd want to take. And then it's about being aware of what comes up. And getting really intimately aware of and familiar with that feeling. Ah, there's that tightness. Ah, yeah. there's that tension. Yeah. Ah, there's that block. Yeah. Now remember, you haven't asked for the block. No. You haven't created the tension. The mind will do that. That's what the mind does. It's just active and it'll make assumptions and evaluations and they'll generally be fear-based. So the mm. first part of the journey is just noticing that, okay, what's coming up? And noticing, noticing that feeling of, no, don't stay small, don't say it, mm. don't take that risk. Because the world will have an idea of who you are, and even people in the past will have an idea of who you were. And the mind is terrified of change. It doesn't want to experience change because change is uncertain, and the mind will find safety through security through there being no change it being able to know what's happening and predict that going forwards so we stay in our comfort zone mm. and the comfort zone is a lovely place to be but nothing beautiful grows there so if we go back and we'll come back to your mum, but even if we go back to jane so you had it initially where there'd be the fear of how you'd be perceived and that would prevent you from saying anything. Yep. Then you had that stage of being aware of the tension, the tightness, yep. trying to hold you back. And then when we were discussing it last time, you were saying you would put out the compliment, but you'd do it in a certain way. Yep. Can you say more about that? How you would how you'd put it out there? So, <laughs> okay, this is going to sound weird. <laughs> um, <laughs> Essentially, I learned the uh, Mandarin word for a beautiful girl, which is menu. 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 Yeah. Because um, like a friend taught me, a friend taught it to me. And yeah. it was like I, at uni, we we had a friend from Singapore who was also a medic in our year. And we would just randomly say, say like ni hao to him, you know, just like, mm -hmm. and then like, oh, ni hao became just like a bit of a, it was like something you would say even to people who want him. And we started greeting each other with that kind of thing amongst our, amongst our friendship group. And so there was always this kind of fascination with like, Say, saying things in Mandarin for some reason. Yeah. Uh, and someone taught me menu uh, as like the, the phrase for a beautiful girl. And so if I noticed Jane was looking particularly, particularly cute, I would say, oh, menu. <laughs> you know, and because yeah. in my mind, that's like I'm telling her that she's beautiful, but totally. like it doesn't require any vulnerability to do so. It's just yeah. purely like, oh, haha, I'm just, yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. just kidding, lol. So you'd almost present it in the form of a joke. Yeah. Yeah. And can you notice any other ways that you'd express it, but it would be almost comical? Something that you could say, oh, only joking. 
There were times where I would say something like, oh, you look very pretty. What have you done today? As like a following, following, following that up. Yeah. Like, have you done something with your hair or something like that? Because, and I, and I kind of recognized at the time that, because I felt uncomfortable with saying, oh, you look really pretty today. Yeah. And just leaving it there. Totally. That I had to follow it up with a, a sort of like, hey, I'm, I'm saying this because I'm asking a question yeah. rather than I'm just saying it because yeah. I want to say it. Totally. Totally. And so one fear is that you'd been perceived as being shallow or just focused on looks. Yep. Were there any other fears of putting yourself out there in that way? Yeah, I think, I think ultimately it was like a fear of, fear of being sincere, fear of being vulnerable, fear of being laughed at almost. I wonder, I wonder if this is a, this is a hang up from the days of being in a, an all boys school where yeah. any amount of anything resembling emotional expression yeah. is met with, huh, gay or what, yeah. you know, things like that. And, th- you know, anytime, you know, back in the day, someone, someone would say, say something nice to one of their friends, they'd have to follow it up with no homo. Like, yeah. I'm not gay, but like, totally. that's a cool hair, 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 hairstyle kind of thing. Totally. And I think it's like that sort of emotional suppression. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Make or was was previously contribute was was contributing to my kind of cringe response at to at saying something sincere. Because what would it mean to be emotional or to be vulnerable or to say something in that area? Yeah, what? I guess in in the days of school that would have been meant some amount of mockery. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you yeah. You'd, you'd be mocked for being. What would you say about that? What would people think about that person? They think that they are, how would you fill in the gap? Oh, like gay would have been the word people used back in 2005 to 2012. Yeah. It's now gone out of fashion. I don't, I don't know what the kids call it these days, but. <laughs> totally. Yeah. And if you were, if you were gay in that regard, yeah. what, what was underpinning that? What did that mean? What was underpinning that? I was in like your. Why so, was it bad? That was bad because it's yeah. like, uh, I mean, A, because it just, at the time, gay was just used as a slur. Um, totally. Just very casually. But I think more like. Oh, and so when, when I was in, when I was in schools pre coming to the UK, so before the age of eight, um, there, there was a, a, a distinctive, um, a distinctive thing that happened when I was in like year two or something, I was in the school in, in Southern Africa, in Lesotho. And I had these two friends, um, these two female friends when I was like, like six years old or something. Um, and we would have lunch together with our little lunch boxes on the field in school. And I remember one time I was like, I stayed late in class to talk to the teacher about something. Yeah. And then I asked one of the guys, oh, have you, had, do you, do you know where like Clarissa and Sanya went? I think, the, I think that was their names. And the guy was like, wait, what? You want to know where those two went? Huh? Ali's got a girlfriend. And yeah. then that became like, you know, the kids were chanting, Ali's got a girlfriend. Ali's got a girlfriend. Yeah. And I think that was, that was quite like, oh, I didn't realize you aren't, you aren't allowed to be friends with girls kind of thing. Totally. Um, and then even growing up in sort of beyond, beyond the age of six, sort of the rest, the, the rest of primary school, there was just this kind of vibe that if you're a, if you're a guy, you don't express your emotions. Otherwise you're a girl. Right. So it was it, in primary school is you're a girl in secondary school. It became your gay. It became your gay. <laughs> that was the kind of totally, the, totally. the thing that stopped uh, yeah. people from expressing their emotions. And the two could be linked yeah. in that whenever we're thinking of someone who's gay, we might associate that with femininity. Yeah. So it's almost as if, okay, this idea of masculinity is that you shouldn't be feminine. Mm. You shouldn't be emotional. Yeah. And the mind will then create an idea around who we are. I'm not an emotional person or it's, yeah. it's dangerous to be emotional or to speak in an emotional way or to tap into my emotions. And I come across it time and time again, mm. That growing up, and I had it too, my role models were He-Man and uh, Hulk Hogan and Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sylvester Stallone. And we had this idea of what it means to be a man. And often it was very centered on masculinity and very centered on the mind. And over time what happens is we begin to shut down to our heart. Mm. We begin to close off to that emotional world. Mm. Now that intuitive part of us, the the heart in us, is where the magic is. 
That's where love, compassion, wisdom grows and flourishes. And it's also what leads to connection. Mm. And all of us are seeking connection. Mm. We're seeking connection with our work, with our family, with our partners. And what can happen is the more we go into our mind, now particularly if you have a brilliant, powerful mind, the more we go into that, the more we can close off to our heart. And the more that we can begin to judge what it means to integrate our masculine and our feminine. And so we lose balance and we get caught up in being rational and objective and there's less feeling. Whereas there's a source of intuitive wisdom in that side of the heart, which a lot of men just over years move away from. Mm. Does any of that connect? Yeah. There was one time where when Jane and I first started dating, um, one of my friends at the time would uh, ask, like, what do you what do you like about her? Mm -hmm. And I always found it hard to articulate that other than be like, I don't know, I just kind of do. Um, yeah. And this friend would say that, oh, well, you know, if you that 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 that's not particularly like emotionally mature of you if you can't like articulate what you like about someone like kind of thing mm -hmm. and i kind of got me thinking it's like that kind of the if i were asked to write a 2000 word essay on what i like about jane or john or like any of my friends really mm -hmm. i could probably come up with something yeah but it would be somewhat disingenuous because it's like th that's a realm within which the intellectualization of what I like about my friend Catherine, for example, it doesn't, it doesn't like scratch the surface of what I actually like about Catherine. Yeah. Which is more like vibes and like, it's, it's almost hard to use language to describe that like relationship than that connection. Um, and I think in the past I've certainly felt that and, and certainly the way I talk with my team about work stuff as well is that, intuition yeah, like if 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 someone is trying to use intuition to back up their point mm -hmm. i'm always like like <laughs> unless you can give me some facts we're we're, we're going with my with the, we're going with my feelings rather than yours on this one yeah um kind of thing yeah and i wonder if that's like an over i don't know i feel like that's the right thing to do but yeah 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 Einstein, Einstein said something along the lines of the rational mind being a faithful servant and the intuitive mind or the intuitive part of us being almost like a sacred gift. But we've come to prioritize and place more credence and value on rationality. Hmm. And definitely part of my journey over the last couple of years has been seeing that there's intuitive wisdom that sometimes draws us towards someone or something that we can't quite explain that we can't put into words but it feels aligned or it feels right or we could meet someone where we have no reason to doubt them mm. but something feels off yep and there's even been some studies to show that looking at high intuitive business leaders mm -hmm. compared to low intuitive, the high intuitive business leaders, 81% were likely to double their business in five years. And it's about 25% for low intuitive. Mm -hmm. Have there been no times for you where you, where your intuition does kick in or do you, would you more often than not stick with the mind? I think usually if my intuition is saying something, I can generally find a way to rationalize that thing as well. Totally, um, totally. So it's not, it's not, it's rarely a, an either or choice. Yeah, but that, that's a brilliant level of awareness to see that your intuition is leading mm. and then the mind will often find reasons to back it up. Mm. And it's a little bit like debating. Once you know that you're committed to putting something forward, yeah. you find reasons <laughs> yeah. to say that I'm right and you're wrong. Yeah. But I think the key is distinguishing between the intuitive part and the rational part hmm. and the heart part and the mind and when intuition is telling you to say something or mm. to do something like i think you look really cute or pretty mm. in that example and the mind says don't do it mm. like don't put yourself out there it's too risky it's not worth it but deep down 
you know what it is that feels true and right for you. Hmm. The, the thing that surely we're not saying that the thing that feels intuitive and right is always the direction that we should go. Like the mind will often come up with totally reasonable objections to doing the thing. Um, yeah. Well, why would you do what doesn't feel right? To me, it feels very right to be very open about like my life and my finances and all this kind of stuff. Cause mm -hmm. it's like helps people and inspires some people and makes for good videos and all this kind of stuff. And it feels like it vibes with one of my core values, which is authenticity and transparency and things. On the other side of the coin, there is a sort of, as, as the numbers get bigger, there's an increasingly uh, high risk of like security stuff happening right. um, in terms of theft and blood burglaries and ransoms and kidnappings and, you know, all of the potentially dangerous things that could happen yeah. to someone who flexes about how rich they are on the internet, essentially. <laughs> yeah. Um, and at the point where, like right now, it's not at the point where that changes the, the decision. Yeah. But I guess, I guess if, you know, like a family were involved and I was genuinely concerned for the safety of my family, right. I mean, at that, at, at that point, the intuition would be stop making these videos. <laughs> like right. it wouldn't really be in, I wouldn't really, I already feel like it's right to make these videos, but the mind is telling me, watch out for the safety of your family. I suspect, I suspect intuition would vibe in that direction as well. Completely. So part of it is seeing that intuition will evolve and change. So it's not that just because we act from a place of intuition, it means that given every circumstance, we will act in the same way actually when we're very open and moving from a place of consciousness or openness yeah and we're not blinded by the thoughts and emotions of the mind we've got clarity of vision so the mind will create filters through which we see the world the more that we can remove those filters the more clarity of vision we have and the more clarity of vision we have, the more sensitive response that we have. So whenever I pick up this cup, I know exactly how much pressure to apply to the glass in order to pick it up. It's yeah. very intuitive. Yeah. That will be a different level of pressure to pick up this cup yeah. or to pick up that piece of sushi. So it will continually evolve and change. And there could be a point where for you intuitively, it does not seem true and right for you to be continuing to do the same things that you did that got you to this point. Yeah. So it can be a, a constant evolving, but I'd say the key part is at least to be aware of mm. intuitively what feels true and right for you. Mm. And if there are times that you go against that, we do, we can do that with awareness. Yeah. So when you're coaching CEOs, like if, if it's a business decision, for example, like do you kind of encourage them to think what, how they feel intuitively about a situation? Or like, what, how, does, how does that process work? The mind will often create confusion because it can see it both ways and it can argue it both ways. But whenever we can find a place of stillness where the mind isn't being as noisy, it, will, it becomes so much clearer what, what intuitively is, is the next move. And so I'd say that whenever we get caught up in, in our mind, we get caught up in, in paralysis mm. because we're dealing with analysis. Whereas from a level of consciousness, we're dealing with awareness. And with awareness, there's clarity. We just, you just see it. Whenever you can allow the emotion and the mind to settle, the water is still. And so you can see through it and you can see, see just what the next step might be. Mm. So I'd say completely it's about naturally listening to the mind because the mind will give you insights so whenever you said that you don't want to be someone who comes across as being shallow or superficial or objective what does that tell you that you value i value kind of i guess the opposite of those things so um depth and connection beyond like rather than shallowness and superficiality yeah so you value depth you value connection by seeing seeing her beauty what what does that tell you i value beauty <laughs> yeah 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 that you have an appreciation for, for beauty yeah so you're so multifaceted you, you value depth you value connection you have an appreciation for beauty once we know that how could you express that from a place of truth with Jane. 
if she came walking in mm. right now and you thought she looked cute and I mm. thought she looked hot, mm. <laughs> I wouldn't say a thing. <laughs> what, what could you say to her? Oh, Jane, you're looking really lovely tonight. Yeah. Yeah, just leave it at that. Full stop. <laughs> yeah. Completely. And that's the way of life. We we take action and then and then it's just pausing and seeing seeing what happens. And depending on the other person's reaction, we we can explore that. Mm. But what's more important is that you move from a place of truth in line with who you are. Because the truth is you know who you are. Mm. You know Ali. Your mind will say, Oh, the fear is they will think that I'm superficial or yeah. objectifying. What is the truth that you know? That I don't think that's how I am. <laughs> yeah. You know that's not who you are. Yeah. I know it. Like having just met you, mm. I know that. That's not who you are. That would be like saying you're a tomato. Like you're not a tomato. <laughs> you're, you're a beautiful man with depth and connection and you care deeply about other people feeling valued and not feeling objectified. Mm beautiful but if the mind gets involved it will prevent us from sharing mm. and sharing is then sharing openly our only task in life is to know our truth and act from that truth mm. and so l last week when we were um we were doing the session with with our, with, with our coach for the, for the whole team and one of the things he asked us to do is figure out in in the areas of health, work, and relationships, what is one identity that we wanted to kind of uh, we 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 sort of aspired to be like? And then what were three of the three core values associated with that identity? Yeah. And in the work context, um, one of my core values was the phrase "share without fear," and I realized that that's the phrase that I need to tell myself whenever yeah. I think, "Oh, I w I would love to make a video about X." But oh no, hang on. A will 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 the video not perform? How how will it perform? What are the numbers going to look like? Is this too niche a topic for the, like the mainstream audience to care about, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Is this is this not interesting enough? Is it not valuable enough? Totally. Do I need to add eighteen times as much content for this to make it to, for, to make it a valuable yeah. piece of content? But I find that the phrase "share without fear" is yeah. like well, I'm sharing. Mm. Yeah. One way to tweak that would be share in the face of fear. Oh. Nice. <laughs> That's good. Feel the fear and do it anyway kind of thing. <laughs> because what's true, the, tr the truth is fear has arisen. Yeah. And that's natural. Yeah. You have a human mind. So the byproduct will be that you experience human emotions. You're the master of a guest house. And each day it's about seeing who arrives at the house. Who's knocking on the door? You open up and you see who's there. Ah, oh, right now there's fear here. It's not who I am. It's just a guest. And we can move to a place where we no longer try and reject the fear yeah, or push it away because whatever we resist will persist. Whatever we try and block will remain there. And that's what leads to paralysis. But if we can almost begin to welcome the fear, hmm. the meaning of life is to experience life. Right now you're being presented with fear. Your only task is to experience that fear because you're bigger than the fear. Where we get stuck is when we think that we are the fear and it's consuming, it's who we are, but you're so much bigger than that. The fear is just the object of the consciousness and your consciousness, which is so much bigger. And this whole journey is about spiritual expansion where, where our consciousness is so big, it can hold all of it. It's just, it's just a part here or a part there that we can see, but that's not who we are. So we don't want to reject or deny the human experience. Mm. There's fear here, but what is your task to share? Yeah. Because I think, I think I was thinking of it in the sense of like, I shouldn't feel fear for this thing. Totally. I should just, yeah. Totally. The mind will come in and judge, judge itself yeah. for feeling what has arisen. Mm. Yeah. And then it'll almost think, well... I'm almost not there yet because I'm I'm the one experiencing fear and I should be fearless. Almost yeah. as if I'm not good enough in that regard. Yeah. But for me, what's 
what's more impressive, what's more admirable, what's more inspiring to have one person who has no fear and who shares or another person who's facing that fear and feels it and knows that it's there and still shares. Now I'm buying your book. Now I'm getting your mm. getting your, your YouTuber Academy. Now I'm doing nice. all these things because because that's real and I feel it too and everyone else feels it too. Fear will always exist. Mm. It's what do we do in the face of it? Nice. That's great. I'm just thinking, what are, what are the other areas, areas of my life in which <coughs> I'm telling myself I, I should be feeling something or should not be feeling something? This yeah. word should, I think, is, a, is interesting. Completely. Should is a fabrication of the mind. The mind will say the world should be this way. But the truth is, the world is both brutal and beautiful. And it's the mind's idea that labels it as good or bad. And as soon as the mind gets involved and creates a should, prepare for suffering. <laughs> what do you mean? All misery arises from reality clashing with expectation. All of it. Mm. We have an idea of how we should be, or someone else should be, or our life should be. And our little dictator in our head says, this is the way it should be and I know best. But the world isn't playing suit. Yeah, It's been unfolding for 13.8 billion years and it's going to keep on unfolding <laughs> yeah. for another trillion years. Yeah. It's fine. Mm. It's doing okay. The mess is inside us when we're saying this is the way that life should be. No, 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 no. Mm. And we even have to be so careful about the language that we use. So when we think I aspire to be this person, what is the premise? That you're not that person. Totally. <laughs> yeah. Totally. How can you be something you're not? Mm. You're not a tomato, so you can't be a tomato. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you aspire to be fearless, but you're not fearless. Yeah. So rather than aspiring to be different, part of it is seeing that those values you described, mm. that is who you are. Mm. Ali, that's there already. You don't need to do anything to make it happen. All you have to do, like we talked about before, is remove the blocks to it flowing through you. Courage, authenticity, strength, innovation, creativity, that's all, that's all part of you. Mm. Wisdom, joy, love, that's already there. You don't need to do anything to create it or find it. Mm. It's like... Someone sitting on a chest looking for treasure. They're, they're already sitting on the chest that, chest that contains it already. And we have to just slow down and look at where are the blocks. And the blocks will come from the mind. The shoulds. Mm. The ideas. The identities. <laughs> Fuck identities. <laughs> An identity is something that you want to wear like you wear your clothes. Sure, put it on... Mm. Put it on for this occasion or that occasion, but don't think that's who you are. You're not your clothes. Mm. We want to treat it the way that often people treat shopping. I'd say ge gender typically females. They'll go and they'll try on 20 clothes and return 90% of them. Yeah. You know, we want to wear them lightly. It's the same with their beliefs. As soon as we get attached to an identity, as soon as we get attached to a belief, prepare to be broken. It's like taking a hammer and if you take a hammer and hit a piece of slate, it's going to smash into a hundred pieces. Mm -hmm. You take a hammer and you smash it into sand and it'll make an imprint, mm -hmm. but over time the wind will blow it and it'll surface out. You take a hammer and you smash it into water and it cuts through, but as soon as you remove the hammer, it just moves back to its original position. Mm -hmm. So it's about being, being fluid about moving from that place of consciousness which cannot be defined, which cannot be put in a box, it cannot be labelled because it's so much more. Mm, nice. What, what comes to you with that? I think that the, the should stuff is particularly interesting because mm. at one point I want, to, I want to write a book slash do some kind of thing around a language that, language that doesn't serve us. Mm. I think the phrase, I don't have time, uh, 
it does not serve us because it removes autonomy from us. Yeah. And in reality, it's I'm choosing not to make the time, yes. whatever the whatever the situation is. Um. I kind of think the word stress, stressful, does not serve us at times. Um. I feel like yeah, this generally complaining also in 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 whatever format. But I've, I've, I've been thinking for a while around this word should in that is there any circumstance in which the word should is actually useful or is it just basically should we try and blanket ban the word should <laughs> from our brain and replace it with something else um, like would like to or have the option of choosing to dot dot dot. Completely. It's yeah. like I can't. Mm, yeah. You choose not to. Mm. Or like you're saying should, should is a... Uh... A value judgment on something. I remember I was on the savannah in uh, the Maasai Mara in Kenya and I was watching a baby leopard feeding by its mother on this baby gazelle. Hmm. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Should should that happen or should it not? Yeah, it's kind of meaningless. <laughs> totally. Yeah. I mean, from the position of the leopard, it should happen. From yeah. the position of the gazelle, it, it shouldn't happen. Yeah. There is no should in nature. Yeah. If you go out into the world, and part of this journey is beginning to experience life, rather than seeing everything as how it impacts us, is taking that step back and seeing that this is just life unfolding, and it's a gift to be a part of it. We're here for such a short period of time. And... We're just here to experience it. So like you were saying, what would you love? What would you like to do? Because there's a, a war going on. And the war is between the external world and other people and our minds saying what should happen. And then there's that internal intuitive place of what you would love to happen. And I've, I've seen, and I'm sure you might be able to testify, to seeing the consequences of what happens when you follow what others or the world or your parents mm. or even your mind's perception says you should do. And it's not a pretty place that you end up. Mm. Moving from that place of what you know, what you would love, that place of truth, does it involve facing fear? Like you said, yes. But the rewards are greater than we can ever imagine. How do you think about the balance here between... Like, for example, I may want to, after this, head down the road and get like three scoops of ice cream. But part of me is like, well, no, I, I also want to improve my fitness and like reduce my visceral abdominal fat because that's bad for me. Yeah. Therefore, I shouldn't go and eat that ice cream. Right. Um, and so the, these are it's sort of like... I might feel in my heart that I really want the ice cream, but also I've uh, like the higher cognitive apparatus that I've <laughs> taken on has decided that that's a bad idea. Right. What do you do in that case? I say that there's a difference between pleasure and joy. Now the mind is built to seek pleasure, avoid pain and conserve energy. So that's what it will be led by. Seek pleasure, go for the ice cream, avoid Pain, don't work out, yeah. conserve energy, stay in the sofa and watch Netflix. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Sure. Joy is so much deeper. There's a richness to joy. There's the great amount of joy that can come even through suffering. It's the reason why people will challenge themselves to run a half marathon or a marathon. It's mm. the reason that athletes put themselves through phenomenal hardship. It's the reason that we are always driven to try and progress mm. because it brings a, a deeper rooted sense of joy. Mm. The more that we can move from a place of joy, that can often bring hardship. It can bring suffering. It can bring pain at times, mm. but it's in line with this bigger calling. So I'd say that the the pleasure drives from the mind. So it's noticing when the mind will have an idea and it'll tell you, Ali, Go and do this, go and do this, go and do this. Yep. But it's an addiction. Yep. And there's a difference in feeling between the addictive mind mm. and an open heart. So the more that we can begin to, this whole 
work that I do is beginning to tease apart the difference between the two. Notice which one's leading. And whenever we go back to it, this battle, it's between the external and the internal. Now the mind gets caught up in the external because it's built for survival and survival is based on what we have around us. But if we dig deeper, what are we all looking for? All of us essentially want a sense of peace and want a sense of joy or this deeper happiness. Mm. The mind will say, you know, what you want is a billion dollars mm. or what you want is a beautiful partner. Mm. But if we had a genie that came in and we rubbed its little belly mm. and someone said, okay, I want a billion dollars and every time I spend money, it'll retop. Mm. The genie says, okay, I'll give you that, but on one condition. For the rest of your life, you're going to be miserable and discontent and restless. Would we choose it? I've seen invariably the answer would be no. We wouldn't want to be in misery. Mm. Or you can be married to this beautiful woman, but you're going to be unhappy mm. and irritable and feeling lost and depressed, feeling suicidal. Mm. Well, we wouldn't want it. So we don't want the thing. Mm. What we want is that sense of peace. And peace and happiness is always an inside job. An inside job, as in? comes from here. It's got nothing to do with the external world. Mm. There's nothing externally that can bring us peace. There's nothing externally that can bring us joy. It can give us moments of pleasure. Mm. It can give us thrills. But that deeper sense of calmness and serenity and peace and clarity, that's inside. Now, when we move from that place, we can still achieve great things. It's not about demonizing the external mm. but we'll be moving from a place of freedom rather than from a place of fear mm. there's so many business leaders and entrepreneurs i've worked with who started on the path with an idea of what they wanted to create or achieve yeah and generally the dictum is or was bigger is better mm. i want to have a company with 100 people 200 people 300 people I want to be growing my company and scaling it and then, and then selling it and exiting. And that's right for some people. But the number of individuals I've worked with who along, along the way have realized, actually, that's not what I want deep down. Mm. What I want <laughs> is to maybe create a product that I'm really proud of. What I want is a small team. What I want yep. is connection within my company. And, and that's something that we talked about. Have, have you noticed that journey over the years for you? Oh, yeah, very much so. Um, it was a major turning point about six months ago, maybe maybe, maybe a bit more, where we had a session with um, another friend who we met on the podcast through, <laughs> starting off with a podcast interview. His name's uh, Dan Priestley. He's written a bunch of uh, business books and is sort of uh, does business coaching and stuff. Um, so he did a whole day team session with us and we talked about the difference between a lifestyle business and a performance business. Mm -hmm. And, you know, his thing was like, you know, between three and 12 employees with a certain amount of revenue per employee, you're in a, you're in a lifestyle business. You've got freedom, fun, flexibilities, everyone, everyone's having a great time making loads of profit. Um, as soon as you get beyond 12 people, now you're in the desert where you're too big to be small and too small to be big. And now yeah. everything goes to shit and the, and the desert is where companies go to die. When you get 40 plus people, that's when you're in performance business territory where you've already got the systems and stuff and you're scaling and you're sp spending loads of money, but you're also making loads of money. You're not making much profit, but you're not really concerned about profit. You're concerned about just building up your um, uh, the assets on your balance sheet. Which of these businesses do you want? Do you want a performance business or do you want a lifestyle business? And I was like, lifestyle business 100 50 yeah. percent like who yeah. the hell wants that and it was like okay that's a, that's a good insight um yeah. and i kind of realized that last year when we overhired we were we were in the desert with like a team of like 18 20 25 yeah. people depending on how you count it and running the business was no longer fun yeah and it felt like work yeah and 
yes, the numbers were getting bigger, but so were the costs. And it's like the profit was getting smaller. It's like, oh shit, like this is the, you know, growth <laughs> mantra. Um, and since then, or even like even in, even before then, you know, I've, I've, I've spoken to some people who have like, you know, companies valued at like 300 million or whatever. And, mm -hmm. and you know, they messaged me being like, hey man, any tips on starting a YouTube channel? I'm like, dude, why do you want to start a YouTube channel? You've got a $300 million company. I'm like, yeah, but you know, it's not that fun. Like investors and faff and team and problems and things. I just love what you do. You know, just, you can make videos about whatever you want and you make money doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I mean, obviously there's a level of survivorship bias here and that the sorts of people that will message me are people who are thinking in those terms. Mm -hmm. And I don't really hang out with the Silicon Valley billionaire types um, for whom they really love the whole big business thing. Mm -hmm. Um even the other day I was speaking to speaking to another friend who's had like phenomenal success with like books and traditional media and like movies and Hollywood and things. And he was saying that, you know, I, I, I thought I wanted all these things and then I got them and I realized it's, it's more fun and reaches more people to just make YouTube videos. <laughs> <laughs> Despite being able to be on TV and movies and things. I was like, damn, this is, <laughs> this is a surprisingly helpful insights from, um, cause whenever I come to a, second guessing myself thinking, oh, you know, if I, if I meet someone who's got a $10 million business, I'm thinking, oh, that's cool. And then, yeah. and the team has realized this as well. They're like, anytime Ali goes to a conference for the next three days, he's going to be on growth mode and we just need to ignore everything he says. And yeah. then three days later that will level out and then we can have a conversation. <laughs> and I was like, damn, that's, that's, that's a good insight. <laughs> totally. Yeah. And that's where all these parts come together. Mm. When, if you ask the world, what particularly a Western capitalist society, what should you do? Yeah. Generally, the answer would be scale and grow. Yeah. Whenever we look at what intuitively feels true and right for you, you know it's the lifestyle business. And your mind could have moments of saying, well, no, but I should stay on this path. I should aspire for more. I should want the totally. $100 million dollar business. Totally. And then I was like, hell no. <laughs> completely, yeah. completely. So that's that's the path. That's this journey of of beginning to tease apart the direction the mind will pull us in and moving from that place of truth within you. Hmm. That's teasing apart what the external says should happen and knowing what you know to be true and right for you. There's the whole like mimetic desire thing you we want what other people want and it's hard to then disentangle the whether it's a true internal desire or it's the mind talking and stuff uh for example the other day i saw a porsche taycan on the road and i was like well i've had a tesla model 3 for a while it's been a few years business has grown bigger porsche taycan would be pretty cool i mean it has got a really nice interior and like you know, the charging infrastructure is blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And I'm sure I'm going to be thinking about this at, <laughs> for, for the next several years. But is, is that the true me thinking I want a Porsche Taycan? Or is that the mind telling me that I want a Porsche Taycan? Like, how do I know the difference? You answered it in your language. You mm. said I'll be thinking. Mm. The mind thinks. And the heart just knows. So whenever it came to Priestley, was it Priestley that was talking to you yeah. about uh, lifestyle over performance? Mm. You just knew. Yeah. You didn't have I to... Did, I, did, I, didn't, I didn't even need to vaguely think about it. No, you didn't <laughs> think like, about this it. This is it. Totally, <laughs> yeah. totally. You just knew. How yeah. did you know? Because you knew. Yeah. Okay. So at some point, I'll test drive the Porsche ticket. <laughs> <laughs> and see if I just know... <laughs> In which case, we're like, all right, fair enough, let's go for it. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Part of it seeing, it depends what we are looking to get from, what is our mind saying that this, that the Porsche will give, will give us? Mm. If we think it will give us a sense of lasting joy, mm. we're being deluded. Mm. But if we can see it for what it is, which is, do you know, I really appreciate this car and it's beautiful. Mm. And I would like the pleasure and the thrill of driving it. Mm. 
Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> and when we can see it for what it is, yeah, it might give us more options. Well, do you know what I might do? I might rent rent that car whenever I really feel like taking it out, and once a month or yeah. or during the summer, I'm going to take a supercar out and do a road trip for three or four weeks. Hmm. So we can still have all these different experiences, but it won't be driven from a place of need. Where we get caught up is when we have an attachment, and an attachment in the Buddha sense is this idea or belief that I need this to be happy. Mm, yeah. And part of the path is seeing what our attachments are. What do we think we need to be happy? Is it the car? Is it the business? Is it the relationship? Is it a lifestyle? Because the truth is we can have all of those things, and I've seen it, and still be miserable inside. Mm. There's an external game and there's an internal game. And unless we pay more attention to the inner game, we'll gain the world but lose our soul. The scriptures, spiritual writings and teachings have said it for millennia. You know, what does it profit a man to gain the world but forfeit his soul? It's the reason why billionaires commit suicide. Mm. It's the reason why people with power and status and prestige can be depressed or alcoholics or addicted to drugs because what the world sell sells us turns out to be a lie. And our path is finding truth. Find truth. Move from that place of truth and the rest takes care of itself. So I guess what are the what are some strategies that we can use to or that I can use to find, I guess in, <clears throat> yeah, to find what my truth is. What, like, how do you, how do you figure this out? So there's nothing to figure out. You're figuring out is on the level of the mind. Hmm. It's about beginning to create space to notice when there's a block. So if we take it back to your example, Jane, it's beginning to notice when there is a part of you that is blocking something off or moving from a place of fear. There are two forces in life and only two, fear and love. And our task is to begin to notice when we're moving from a place of fear. Hmm. And our choice is to move from a place of love. Now that can involve facing fear, but we're coming from a different place. We're not doing something based on what we're afraid someone else will think or what it will mean about us. We're moving from a place of wisdom and joy and love. So in that instance of sharing with Jane, it would just be in, in every little micro moment, just tapping in and bringing ourselves back to our center. Mm. Rather notice whenever we're in our head and all that activity and begin to slow down we have to create space for it. One of the biggest problems is we're all in the move so much. We're in this constant mouse wheel and we're constantly just active. It's about slowing down and creating space. Whenever we can create space, solitude is a big part of it. Having time just for yourself. When you have space, when you have solitude and you create that for yourself, everything begins to settle mm. and then you have more clarity mm. and, and brilliant ideas will come to you about your career or about what your relationships mean to you or about what you'd love to happen. Mm. But the first place we have to start with is allowing that to arise. We don't need to create it. It'll, it'll flow through you. Yeah. I find when I'm on a plane with just a journal in my hand. Yeah. I come up with some great insights. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So going back to with, with Jane, you were saying at one point you were in a way making a joke about something that was truthful. Mm. And even then we want to pause and hold on and see you are not a joke. Your relationship is not a joke. Your life is not a joke. And so it's about being aware of when the mind will turn it into a joke or diminish it or demean it. Because that is not truth. 
And so when we move back to that place of truth, it's then just sharing in the face of fear. So if you were to, if you were to share in the face of fear now, what would that look like? In the Jane situation? Or in the Jane situation or even with anyone else? If I were to share in the face of fear. I would tell my mom I love her more often. <laughs> yeah. That would be sharing in the face of fear. Yeah. It's like I've got the fear, I've got the block, but it's like, cool. Hey, there's that block. Yeah, completely. Mm. Okay, so let's take that. So your mom would be letting her know that you love her. Mm. And when you tap into that deeper place, you can feel that feels true and right for you. That mm. is something that you'd like to do. Yeah. And then you've got the mind sphere, mm. which would be, what would it say? Oh, lol, she's going to see through this. She's going to think you've read a self-help book or talked to, to someone on the podcast who's told you that it's a good thing to do for your relationship to tell your parents that you love them. Lol, this is insincere. Yes. That's what the mind is saying. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Now, part of it is seeing that if she chooses to think that, that is her right. Mm. Actually, she has the freedom to. She could judge you for it or mm. chastise you for it mm. or try and place you in a box for it. Mm. But that doesn't matter. Mm. What anyone else says or does tells you nothing about you. Mm. It only tells you what's going on inside of them. And we can only know or we can only assess us on what we do, not on what the response is. So we continually mm. go back to, the freedom comes from continually going back to the two things we can control, our approach and the actions we take. Mm. Everything else we let go of. You like it, great. You don't, that's okay. The more we move from a place of truth, the people that are meant to be closer to us will come closer. And the people who are meant to be more distant will begin to move away. We don't have to create balance. Yeah, Everyone gets concerned with creating balance, but they try and do it on a mental level. But there's too many variables to be able to, to decipher or mm. encode. I mean, what would balance even look like? It'd be a mental conundrum. On, on any level, do I do three hours of this and there's two parts of that and one mm -hmm. here? Whereas when you move from a place of truth, equilibrium will find itself. Mm. So what about texting or calling your mom now? Sure. When do I find her? <laughs> All right. Just texted her. I love you. With a little kiss emoji. Hmm. And you, you didn't combust into flames. No, <laughs> I managed it. <laughs> yeah. And it can just then be taking a little step, mm. you know. And even if it's a conversation around, we can share from a place of truth, even about our fear. Mm. You know, just so you know, mum, there's something which I'm working on. It's got nothing to do with you. Mm. I know it's about me. And I actually, I really struggle with saying, I love you. Mm. And, and you haven't done anything wrong because this isn't about you. It's about me. But I can tell that my mind is worried about sharing that mm. and think that if I do, you'll maybe think I've read a self-help book mm. or spoken to someone on a podcast and it's not real or that in this strange way you're kind of seeing through it. Mm. And I can't explain it, but I just want you to know that I love you. Mm. And you don't have to say anything or you don't have to do anything about it, but that's the truth. Mm. Yeah, I think it's that thing of noticing when it's fear fear or love. Mm. That's, that's not yet a default for me to kind of notice that. Yeah. I'll often notice if I like catch myself grumbling about something and you're like nah things will find us as they are because i've i guess trained that thought process over 10 years of reading stoicism and stuff but am i am i moving from a place of fear or from a place of love right now i think it would be a really good yeah good mental model ali that'd be beautiful if in each moment you could just become a, a little bit more aware of am i moving from a place of fear or moving from a place of love that's it mm. Literally, that's it. There's nothing else to do. There's nothing else to figure out. Yeah. It's just moving from a place of love. 
Yeah. And I guess if I'm, when in those moments when I'm overthinking, oh, I, 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 I don't want to film this video yet because it's not, it's not yet good enough. It's like, am I really moving from a place of love or from, from a place of fear? Yeah. If I'm moving from a place of love and I think actually from a place of love, this video needs more work. Great. Yeah. But often it's fear. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Totally. Because most people are identified with their mind. Yeah. Because the mind is so active. But remember, it's a servant, but we've allowed it to become the master. This whole path is about moving back to our center, mm -hmm. creating separation from mind. Mm -hmm. It's not, like we said, it's not peace of mind, it's peace from mind. It's seeing that it's a tool and it's an amazing tool. And it's phenomenal what the mind can do. And we can direct the mind and give it tasks to work on and problems to solve. But our task is to come back to that place of center. And that place of center is that field of consciousness. And consciousness is truth, which is love. So when we're moving from that place of truth, we're moving from a place of love. They're synonymous. I feel like that's a good place to end this. Nice. Yeah. Nice. All right, so that's it for this week's episode of Deep Dive. Thank you so much for watching or listening. All the links and resources that we mentioned in the podcast are going to be linked down in the video description or in the show notes, depending on where you're watching or listening to this. If you're listening to this on a podcast platform, then do please leave us a review on the iTunes store. It really helps other people discover the podcast. Or if you're watching this in full HD or 4K on YouTube, then you can leave a comment down below and ask any questions or any insights or any thoughts about the episode. That would be awesome. And if you enjoyed this episode, you might like to check out this episode here as well, which links in with some of the stuff that we talked about in the episode. So thanks for watching. Uh, do hit the subscribe button if you aren't already, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.